It takes a while for there to go night rock. Okay. Alright, guys. So, um, let's pray. Thank you, Father, so much for your word. Thank you, Lord, that your word is life. You are life to us. You are the light and the darkness. You are the tree of life in which we partake. You are the vine in which we attach ourselves. And you bear your fruit through us. You are the light that shines through our broken vessel. You've chosen the, sh- the weak things to shame the wise. You're the one who lifts up the humble, the head of the weary. Thank you, Father, that you are the generous one, the selfless one. You extend yourself to us even when we're not looking for you. We're not reaching for you. We're not acknowledging you. And yet, while we were yet sinners, you died for us and made a way back so that we could be reconnected with you. We could know you and walk with you. And that just, thank you, Lord. That's so amazing. And you invite us in to your work. Lord, I just pray right now that as we look at your work, we would stand in awe of who you are, that we would get a new appreciation for all that you've done, all that you've created, and what you are doing in our lives presently, that we would learn to walk and step with you and how to share this glorious inheritance, this great treasure with other people. Father, I just pray that you would show us how to um, be the light. And um, just get out of the way so that your light can shine through us. Thank you, Lord, for this great privilege that you have given us of knowing you. Please bless our time. Anything that is not of you, Lord, I just pray that it would fall to the ground, that it would not do any damage. Lord, I pray that it, um, that you would give all of us ears to hear what you would have uh, said that we would have hearts ready to respond in any way that you prompt by your Holy Spirit. Lord, I am not a teacher. You are the teacher. You are the one who does. You are the one who enlightens. You are the one who gives wisdom and understanding. And so I acknowledge that. Please use uh, use me as you see fit. Use Eras as you see fit. In your name we pray, Lord Jesus, for your glory and honor and praise. Amen. So, um, Sukkot is over, and uh, traditionally, ah, sorry, threw the Bible on the floor. Uh, traditionally, uh, the Torah cycle flips over, and I know this was a couple weeks ago, but um, my kids know that Genesis is my favorite, favorite, favorite book in the whole entire world. And the creation story is my favorite, favorite, favorite story in the whole entire world. And so every year we go back through the creation story and we go really slowly through it. Because, um, it is working. Okay. Because um, it is the foundation of everything. And um, quite literally, you can... If you understand the pattern that's laid out in Genesis, you will understand the whole of Scripture because the the rest of the Scriptures are just an unfolding of the same cycle, the same pattern. And God is busy trying to show His nature, who we are, who we're created to be, His redemptive nature through this cycle over and over and over again. So the reason why I love it so much is because it's this huge metaphor for everything else that he's doing, not only in the scriptures, but in all of history. I mean, you could just look at history books and see the same pattern being played out. You can look in your own life and see the same pattern played out. So to me, this is just the the fundamental uh, thing. Um to understand. So, um, I want to look at at just a couple of things here from the creation story. So, we're going to be in Genesis. And I'm going to note 
some verse, uh, some some chapters of stories. I'm going to make references to some stories, uh, but I don't have all the particulars. You'll have to get with me if you want chapter and verse um, of everything. So we're going to talk sort of in broad terms, um, but we're going to hang out in Genesis. Also, I want to make a note that um, I believe that God created the heavens and the earth as it was written in Genesis, but we're not going to look at it from a creation standpoint, like in the physicality of, of the earth being made manifest. Instead, we're going to draw a parallel to God's creative aspect when he recreates man or humankind when they come to know him. So we're going to take this and sort of draw a comparison, okay, um, and see what there is to glean from this because it is this huge metaphor that God uses over and over again to help us understand what he does, what his work cycle is. So we start out. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Now, if you just took that one verse, it's seven words in the Hebrew. Um, that is actually a summary of God's work for the whole of humanity and all of time and eternity. Um, but we're not going to do that, so we'll just go on. Um, it's a good study, though, if you want to do it. Now, the earth was formless and empty, and darkness covered the face of the watery depths, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the surface of the waters. Now, I think this is a really important starting point. We haven't even got to day one, but this tells you the state that we were in. Formless, void, and yet there was water. And the Spirit of God was hovering. The word hovering there in the Hebrew is like brooding, like a mother hen with her wings outstretched, covering and protecting that egg that's underneath her, the eggs in her clutch. So, you know, the idea is that there is a life that is being nurtured and, and kept for a period of time until that life is fully mature and then breaks forth. So there's this idea that is there that is being nourished and cherished and, and kept until the right time to be brought forth. This is the way God starts the earth. He starts us. It says in other places later on in the scriptures that he foreknew us, that that there was good works that were prepared for us from before the foundations of the earth, before anything was all set up. He had already prepared what he wanted us to do. And it's, so the thing that to take away from this is there was a very definite intentionality, and there was a nourishing and a care that was demonstrated in the very first parts of the Bible by the Lord. It also reveals to us the nature of God as creator. A creator has an, an intellect. They think about what they're going to create. Not only do they have an intellect, but they have to have power to create. And so now we have a creator who has thought about what he's going to do and power to do it, but he also has to have resources in which to do that work. But there was nothing. So where did he create from? Himself. There was no dirt. There is no dirt. So he created from himself. He was so self-sufficient. You want to talk about someone self-sufficient. God was so self-sufficient. He could create all things from the resources of himself. Amen. Amazing. Everything you see was created from the resources of God himself. That's why we're ex exhorted in Romans to look at nature. Yeah. Yeah. Because nature is all speaking necessarily of the na natural characteristics of God. Yeah. It is all a reflection. Yeah. So, this creator God hovers over the face of the earth and then he says, let there be light. And there was light. And God saw that the light was good. And God separated the light from the darkness. And God called the darkness night, or the light day, and he called the darkness night. And evening came, and then the morning, the first day. So, 
The first day brings with us a distinction between uh, dark and night. In fact, the first several days are going to bring these distinctions, these divisions, where the Lord is starting to separate things one from another to bring order out of a chaotic situation that we were in before. Remember, it was it was without form and without void. So as a good artist, he's going to start to separate things out and get things into an order to bring about his creative masterpiece. You know, before we had an experience with God, our life was like that world that was described, that formless void. You know, we were separated from God and there was a disconnection from our spirit and God's spirit. We were spiritually dead, the Bible says. And so we were in a state of a void. That void was where God was supposed to be, but was not. And it was a dark place. We had no light. And and some of us were even happy in our sins because there was no light, so we could just do whatever it was that seemed right to us. But there also was a sense of knowing that it was there is a darkness there. Many, many people give testimony as they look back on their life and they recognize that in those unregenerate days, those days before we knew God, before we knew His light, before we understood anything about right and wrong, we see the hand of God on our life where we were maybe saved from a, a tragedy or from some sort of disaster happening to us. And we recognize, oh my goodness, God had His hand on me even in those days when I didn't know Him. Just like the Spirit of God hovering over that, that area that was going to become the world. And that's before we even had a recollection of who God was or, or and knew anything. But then he speaks that word of light into our life. And he awakens us. It is a great awakening. The light shining forth, bursting forth. It says in the Passion Translation. I love that. It burst through the darkness. And there was light. If you read John, John discusses how, how the word, the word was with God in the beginning. The Word was God in the beginning. And that first word, let there be light, later on John expounds just a few verses later, it says that Jesus was the life and He was the light that came forth. And when God speaks into the darkness of our soul, His light, we become awakened and we see the light of God for the first time. And, and, and we recognize there's a difference between dark and light. That awakening sets the stage and it's the very first the very first thing, it's the inspiration of what God's gonna do. Now at that point, John goes on to say that the men of the world didn't want the light. They rejected the light because the light exposed them. And they were happier in their darkness than being in the light. They didn't want to be exposed. And, you know, at that point, you can either choose to move towards the light or away from it. If you move towards the light, then I believe that there's a second day that happens. Now in creation, of course, God just did his masterpiece. But there is a human aspect of will that the Lord has when he created us, he created us in his image. And, and part of his image and likeness is that he chose to create us. He had a will. And he made us with a will as well that reflects him. And so we have a, a choice to move towards the light or away from the light. The second day, let there be an expanse between the waters, separating water from water. So God made the expanse and he separated the water under uh, from the expanse of the water above. Um, and so it was, God called the expanse sky. And evening came and morning the second day. 
So the second day we've got water above from water below. Okay? And in this water above, water below thing, there's a distinction between the heavens that are above, and, and metaphorically speaking, from God, and from that which is going to be the earth, everything that's underneath. And in between is this great expanse of air. Very important. We need air to breathe. In fact, it's probably the most important thing. If we take water, if we take food away from you, you'll last, you know, 30 days, 40 days, something like that. If you take water away from you, you last mm, three or so days. If we take air away from you, you last like three minutes. <laughs> air is probably the most fundamental thing we need. And yet we tend to not think about it because we don't see it. And we just expect it to be there. And yet, this is the basis for life right here, is this blowing of air, if you will, in between the two heavens, the separation that happens between God and man. It's where we're going to live our life, actually, with our feet on the ground and our, and our head in the air. The air, the spirit, I would say, because it's the ruach, it's the spirit, it's the breath, will make this is the first thing that God revives in us when he creates new life. When we say, I want you, Lord, he has to take us from a disconnected place from him to a connected place with him by giving us a new spirit. The spirit has to be recreated so that it can speak with him, talk with him, understand him, see him once again. And that's what we lost back in the garden when we chose the road of disobedience. The spirit is all important. It is what brings us salvation from the dead. The third day, by the way, the second day has no note of goodness. Every day, it's good, it's good, it's good, it's good, it's good. No note of goodness on two, day two. Um, it's a it's a withholding of judgment. Uh, even God didn't judge that day as good or bad. Wow. And I think it's because um, we don't know that which is deep within man. Of course, God knows. But I think it's a sober warning for us not to judge the innards of somebody else, where they are in connection with the Lord. Uh, to withhold that judgment. If God withholds the judgment till the end of time, maybe we ought to as well. Um, day three, let the uh, let their water under the sky be gathered into one place and dry land appear. And so it was. And God called the dry land earth. And the gathering of the waters he called seeds. And he said that it was good. And then he said, let the earth produce vegetation and seed-bearing plants. And fruit trees on the earth bearing fruit and seed within it according to their kinds, and so it was. And the earth produced vegetation, seed bearing plants according to their own kinds, and trees bearing fruit with seed according to their kinds, and God saw that it was good. And evening came, and then morning, the third day. Now, the previous day, there was no pronouncement of good. This day, it's good twice. So, you have good when the first thing happens, which is the distinction between uh, water and land. And then we have the next thing that happens, we have land with, you know, trees on it and bushes and plants and flowers and all that stuff. Um, and so we have vegetation that grows. The water and the land separation, personally, I think that this is where he creates in us a new heart. Okay, I think this is a metaphor for a new heart or a soul, if you will. I, I sort of drew this little picture out. I'm still working on it. But if this is where the spirit dwells, in that air area, if we're thinking in the terms of like a, a world, and then you have land and you have water that is now divided out. Water uh, 
is is these two together sort of take our soul area up. And and I'm we're talking in pictures here, okay? Um water is mostly related to our emotions. And we're going to see this sort of fleshed out here as we go along creation-wise. Land is like our intellect. And there's a distinction between the two. Okay? Um, these together is when God blew his breath into the, the dirt form that he had of Adam, it creates this nephesh here. This soul area, which we come to know as ourselves. The um, emotions, of course, we talk about emotions as like water. In fact, Proverbs tells us that, um, that in the heart of a, of a man, that a man of understanding will draw that out, that, that that will be something that's like a key to the insides of a person. And, um, and then we have the intellect aspect where we have a, a heart that can either receive the word of God or can't because it's hardened. And, and Jesus uses this picture, actually, when he's talking about the parable of the sower, right? And he says, you know, the word of God falls either on good soil or bad soil. And if it falls on good soil, then it produces what? fruit it you know here's your trees and bushes and whatever uh or your crops where the, that word goes into the soil well there was a time in our unregenerate days when we couldn't hear the word of god and respond to it so the prophets prophesied of a time when god would give us a new heart in ezekiel that that heart would be no longer like a stone that can't receive the word of God, but instead it'd be a heart that would be soft and pliable, able to receive that word, and it would bear fruit. So this is a metaphor that God uses, not just me, um, to, to talk to us about what the word is going to do within us. And not only does it bear fruit, but this fruit, when God created it, had seed in it. So it was fruit that would bear fruit that would bear fruit. It had potential energy, if it, as it were, in it that was going to continually bear within us. So um, it was everlasting. As a man thinks, so is, so is he. That's right. As a man thinks, so is he. And we have to renew our minds in Christ Jesus. So as we're being rebuilt as a new creature in Christ, this is an area that has to be rebuilt. We will live by faith, by what we believe. And what we believe will inform eventually our emotions. We may not feel it right away, but what we believe will eventually inform our emotions. So from our new spirit, our connection with Christ, that we, then we make certain choices. And in fact, I think this is directly related to... Um, People say, well, if you believe in your heart and confess with your mouth, then you'll be saved, right? And so we have this believing, speaking out, and it's all interactive, that confessing, and then that brings a furthering of salvation, a greater faith as we begin to work this out more and more fruitful in your life day after day as you declare the promises of God, then that sows another good word, you're preaching to yourself, into your, your, your soil, which brings more faith and trust, and you just keep repeating that cycle year after year, time after time, and before you know it, you have a very fruitful garden. Fourth day, sun, moon, and stars, right? Let there be lights in the expanse of the sky to separate the day from the night. They'll serve the signs as festivals, uh, and for days and years, there'll be lights in the expanse of the sky to provide light on the earth. And so it was, and God made the two great lights, the greater light to have dominion over the day, the lesser light to have dominion over the night, as well as the stars. Okay, so a couple of things really interesting about this. This is the second witness. And, and what I mean by is this. We had light at day one. 
But now we have light made manifest in a physical realm in our life, very tangible, sun, moon, stars. Not only that, but in the Torah, God says that the sun and the moon and the stars will stand as witness against you if you don't obey my law. I will call them as into witness against you. And so they're standing up there, almost like they're looking down on us, saying, did you choose me or did you do life yourself? Did you go my way or your way? And they're a witness to the light that we had experienced way back at step one. Day, day four brings a physical manifestation. Not only that, but this is the first time we see authority. Because the sun, moon, and stars were set. They were delegated by God to reign over day and night. Well, that tells us something about our Creator, God. He's not afraid to delegate. That means He's he's willing to share His power with a sun and a moon, a created thing. Yeah. Amazing, huh? It also indicates that we have a will because these were set up specifically for times and seasons, festivals, meeting times, so it tells us that God really did intend to have a relationship with his creatures. And we have a will whether or not we're going to show up. It's all foreshadowed right there. And we have a will and the new man to choose, are we going to meet with God or not? Are we going to obey or not? Are we going to walk in his ways or not? And so the sun, moon, and stars... They'll stand witness with us as how well did we do? Did we obey or not? You could think of the meeting times almost as a peer review time or a uh, job review time when your boss brings you in and says, hey, let's talk about your performance. Now, I am not a performance-based person. However, God will meet with you and say, I want to talk to you about your self-pity. I want to talk to you about your discontent and that Holy Spirit who is his job is to convict us of our sin. He'll bring it up. Oh, man. You have a choice. You can agree with God or you can disagree. And from God's perspective, that which was done in the flesh, that's, that's the part of us that is perverted by sin. That which was tainted, corrupted, is of no good. It's no use. And it must die. That must die. And so when he looks at you and he says, my child, let's talk about your grumbling. That has to die. And at that meeting time with him, whether it be on a Shabbat or at a festival, or an evening reflection. If you agree with him, you lay it down on the altar and you let it die. And in that moment, you've identified with Christ. And it's a, you know, the sun, the moon, and the stars, they witness it. All of creation witnesses what's going on. Jesus says, or, or God says, actually, in the Psalms, he says, precious in the sight of the Lord is the dying of his saints. We're told to put our lives on the altar daily. Present yourself as a living sacrifice before the Lord. Jesus says, take up your cross and follow me. And he was heading to Golgotha. We're to die. Die to what? Just go kill ourselves? No. Die to the flesh, the old ways. That which God is desperately trying to set us free from. You know, four is incredible on in the menorah in traditional sense. It's often lifted up. It's sort of a little higher than the other ones. And it, 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 it is a raising up. It's the one of inspiration of light. Even the, even the idea of giving of the Torah, it was lifted up. Jesus said, I've got to go and be lifted up. Just like the snake was lifted up. 
in the wilderness, Moses lifted that up and that the people turned and looked upon that bronze snake, they would be healed of their sicknesses. And Christ made that reference about himself. When we, when we die, we too are raised up, as it were, unto death. And it's an identification with that. And then where did Jesus go? He went into the ground, right? So he's buried. But we have the fifth day of creation. And that's birds and fish. They're all created, right? Um, so we have let the, let the water swarm with living creatures and let the birds fly above the earth across the expanse of the sky. So God created the large sea creatures and every living creature that moves and swarms in the water according to their kinds. And he also created every winged bird according to its kind. And God saw that it was good. So God blessed them. Be fruitful, multiply, fill the waters of the seas, and let the birds multiply on the earth. And evening and morning came the fifth day. So the unique thing about this day is that there was a blessing that was given. So first time God blessed uh, and, and gave a command to multiply. And um, and what we have here is birds and fish, right? So if we're following sort of the picture here, the spirit realm would be this air realm, right? And we have now birds that are flying in here, okay? And uh, and then in the water, we have fishies. Sorry, forgive my drawing. Um, things that happen, with, or the picture of birds and fish is amazing because birds and fish have some unique characteristics that they both share. One, they're very community-oriented, for the most part. I know there are exceptions where you have individual types, but most of them, they're in shoals of fish or schools of fish, or they're in flocks. They hang out together, okay? They tend to uh, instinctively migrate together, whether they're fish or birds. They tend to have, um, they tend to be very beautiful. They tend to sing. Both birds and fish sing. Also, they're cold-blooded. They're cold-blooded. Yeah. Okay, birds are not cold-blooded. Can you? Fix me? Yeah, they're related because they were created on the same day. <laughs> uh, so you have some very interesting things, but you know what? They are identified for the most part by their species. You know, we are all birds because we all have this particular thing. We all fly. We all, you know, we're all bald eagles because we have these certain characteristics, or we're all, you know, pigeons because we're all this way or that way, and. Um, but you see for the first time community uh, here in the created world. And this community hangs together and they sing. And, and their, really their beauty is as much in their unity as it is in their individual aspects of birds. I, when we were in Israel um, in our apartment in Haifa, they had fruit bats that were there and um, they come under flying creatures so I'm going to treat them like birds um, and they were amazing we used to hang out the window and watch the fruit bats because they would uh, come out at night and eat the insects that were in the area we loved them and, um, and they would tumble and do all these acrobatics in, in the air and um, I can remember just being amazed how did they do that without hitting each other I mean, they literally, they just, it was like watching a circus um, every night. And, and they never, I never once saw one collide in with another. And, and they were just in perfect unity. They, I, you never saw two fruit bats going after the same insect and them, you know, banging heads ah. together. Uh, say, man, that was my insect. You know, give it back. No, you know. They, they didn't do that. Somehow they communicated with each other and they knew. And I think... What we're seeing here is when you die to yourself and all your selfishness, 
then you are prepared to be in the community of God. And you can interact in unity. And it's a beautiful thing. In fact, that was the prayer of Jesus in John 17, was that we would be one together. And John later on says in his epistles, that that we would be known by the great love we shared, one for another. It would be so beautiful that that's how the outside world would identify us. And they would stand in awe of that. Because, you know, the world is inherently selfish. But as we take on the character and nature of God, we start to look like our Creator who was selfless and generous and loving and kind. And that's what becomes our indicator. And it's beautiful. Well, what else does that community do? It sings. That's the way that it communicates. Okay, the birds, that's how they knew where to go, what to do. The fish, that's how they they would call one to another, make sure they meet up to go, hire, you know, do their migratory travels. So, what does Paul say? How are we supposed to interact with one another? In songs and hymns and spiritual songs, making melody to the Lord in our hearts. The community is to be corresponding with one another in songs, just like this day five here. And it's a beautiful thing. So I think also some other things happen. If you think of the birds being in this airy area, then it would have something to do with the spirit. Right? If, if the metaphor holds up, then the birds are going to show up in the spirit realm. Well, what do we know of the spirit? The spirit has certain attributes or giftings, if you will. The fruits of the spirit. I guess not giftings, but fruits would be an attribute. So, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness, and self-control. The unique thing is that they are the spirit fruits. And this is fundamental because we have to get out of the mindset that somehow we are going to be recreated and cleaned up and fixed from our brokenness and somehow we will manifest the fruits in our flesh. We won't. Ever. It's the Spirit's fruits. The flesh has to die so that the Spirit can be made manifest. As long as you are trying to be good, you will fail. Every time, because the flesh can no, do no good. It has to be the Spirit in us. And we've got to somehow just beg God to make that real to us. We could say the words all day long, but, but until it becomes actual in our, our experience, we'll continue with that sin, confess, sin, confess, sin, confess cycle. So this, when, when, when our spirit is rightly related to God's spirit, then now these fruits can start to be made manifest in us. And the beauty of that is as this happens and you start to experience love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness, and self-control, then your emotions get in line and you start to feel happy. You start to feel content. You start to feel joy and pleasure in an emotional sense. And when you lose that, if you will use this mind that God gave you to think on the goodness of God, that will stir up the Spirit as you confess with your mouth that your flesh is no good and that it's Christ who is going to live in you even though you don't feel it at that second. And as you begin to confess that willfully with your mouth, it stirs up the Spirit the Spirit now manifests its own fruit, its own character, its own nature. And as that wells up within you, it changes your emotions. And so the soul just sort of falls back in on itself. We're told to stir up the Spirit within us. It's a command. When we use our will to choose to sing, to choose to rejoice, to choose to give thanks, we're, we're, we're falling in line with walking in the Spirit, stirring up the Spirit. And we're being led by the Spirit in those things. And then we're more able to receive the giftings of the Spirit. We can hear better. We can, un- that word of knowledge, 
that understanding, that use, that teaching, that, that use of prophetic gift, whatever, is less hindered by our flesh. And so we're more likely to, quote unquote, get it right. Because we're not hearing our own desires in there. There's no competing voices if we are fully under the sway of the Lord. It becomes a beautiful thing. It's also a hidden thing. All this stuff is done in our cavity of our chest, you know, in our innermost being. It's not something that's on display. And yet, when you are in the presence of somebody else who is in this process of being led by the Spirit, you know it. Your Spirit speaks to my Spirit, as it were. There's a reverberation. We're on the same wavelength, we would say. There's an identity. Paul puts it this way. We have one Father, one baptism, one spirit. We're all in unity under the headship of Christ. One body. And so we are in community based off of our relationship with God. We are, if you will, all of the same breed or species. So this is another picture of what God does for us after our flesh is dead. And we begin to interact in this. Now, can you go to church and still be a very fleshly Christian? Absolutely. Look at 1 Corinthians. There's a nice picture of 1 Corinthians of what that looks like. And you will see dysfunction. It is not this beautiful picture of the way it was intended to work. There's fighting and backbiting and slander and permissiveness and, and disobedience and rebellion. There is... Uh, legalism and there is a promotion of self I've got a better teacher than you do I follow Peter oh, I follow Paul well I follow Apollos well, I follow Jesus I'm better than all of you there's this one upping that goes on pride and it's ugly it destroys what God is wanting to do within the community. Can you be in a community and still be fleshly? Absolutely. But it's not pretty. And it's not what God intended. They said, But the earth produce living creatures according to their kinds. Livestock creatures that crawl in the wildlife of the earth according to their kinds. And so it was. And God made the wildlife of the earth according to their kinds, the livestock according to their kinds, and the creatures that crawl on the ground according to their kinds, and God saw it was good. And then God said, let us make man in our image according to our likeness. They will rule the fish of the sea, the birds of the sky, the livestock of all the earth, and the creatures that crawl on the earth. So God created man in his own image. He created him in the image of God, and he created them male and female. God blessed them, and he said to them, be fruitful, multiply, Fill the earth and subdue it. Rule the fish of the sea, the birds of the sky, and every creature that crawls on the earth. And God also said, Look, I have given you every seed-bearing plant on the surface of the entire earth, and every tree whose fruit contains seed, this food uh, will be food for you, for all the wildlife of the earth, and for every bird of the sky, and for every creature that crawls on the earth, Everything having the breath of life in it, I have given every green plant for food. And it was so. And God saw all that he had made, and it was very good. Evening came, and morning the sixth day. So this is the last day of creation, if you will. Two things that were made. One is the uh, animals that roam the earth, and they were good. And then there was man, and he was very good. He was the create the the crowning glory. Man had an interesting thing that was involved with him. He was given the blessing of the birds and the fish to be fruitful and multiply. And I guess you could say that the whole fruitfulness idea actually came from the land. And then it was added to the birds and the fish. They were to multiply. Now with mankind, they were told to be fruitful and multiply. And thus they were to take dominion and subdue the earth. Uh, we could say rule, subdue, take dominion, manage, 
however you want to put it that way. So he was given a job in addition. And he was made after God's image. And so he had uh, the aspects of the creator that we've all been seeing uh, up until this point in time. The ability to think and reason. The ability to make plans. He was going to have resources in which to do the work that God puts before him. He was going to um, be in the likeness and image of God. And so he was intended to be generous and kind and and giving to the creation to to hover over it to care and nurture it that was the way that God intended for this n- this nature to be taken care of notice that he was to take over and take dominion over the land and the animals the birds and the fish but not people he never said take dominion over one another that didn't come till after the fall Before the fall, it was the same picture we have that is in the New Testament when Christ is talking to his disciples and he says, you know, it's the Gentiles who have dominion one over another, but not so you guys. If you want to be greatest in the kingdom, you go serve. Go serve. And it's a very flat structure if you read the epistles. It's Christ as head and then the body. And we're all to give deference to one another and consider the other people as more important than ourselves, submitting ourselves one to another. It's a very flat uh, structure. We are not to rule and reign over one another. And if you happen to be one of the fivefold, if that's your anointing, your calling, then you're called to a life of servitude, not to a life of dominance. So we're told that the animals, these these guys are created on the land, and they're different. They're in community too, just like the birds and the fish were. But their community purpose is a little different than the birds and the fish. The birds and the fish are identified because they're of the same species, of the same breed, and they tend to go and move by instinct to different places. But you see something different in these land animals. If you watch nature videos, uh, one of the fascinating things is watch a wolf pack go take down the gazelle. You know, there is thought that goes into that. You know, run, gazelle, run. You know, they're coming on the side. Oh, no, they're coming on the other side. Whoa, it's an ambush. And they go, and they go, and they go. And, you know, the the music goes, and there's great drama, and then they get the gazelle and, you know, share it for a feast. But they thought about it, and they worked together. There was teamwork right there. Or, alternatively, you are the prey, and the wolf is coming to get you, and the the young ones are put in the center, and the older ones, the big ones, sort of go out to the side, and and they you know protect. And you see the or you see the elephant trail. They're going to their watering hole, and the mama elephants and the grandmama elephants are all there, and they're making sure the baby elephants keep up. And you know there there's actual thought that goes into these guys. And if you look at it, it's a picture of what we were told to do. We were told to go and establish a kingdom. And we ain't going to do it on our own. we got to do it in unity, in community, working together. Not just because we're all related and we're all family somehow, but we, there, he will put us in certain groupings to do certain jobs in our local area, and we need to be working together to bring about the kingdom of heaven here. That's what we were told to do. And so there's a physical manifestation of the work, the dominion work that God gave us. Now, we aren't having rule and reign over people like like the uh, Crusades. You know, it's not that kind of mentality. We're seeking not a certain level of of, uh, accolades in the world systems, but rather for us to shine the light in those systems to bring about the kingdom of God wherever it is that he placed us, whether that be in arts and media or in politics or in a religious sphere as a traditional pastor or missionary or or whatever, or as a mom, or whatever our role is that he put us in, in that aspect we are to be the light. 
and we take dominion in our little sphere of influence, whatever it is, whether it be little or big, that's where we are to shine. And we gather with other people who are shining in that same area. And we seek the Lord. How do, how do you, Lord, want us to take over this area for you? To re, you really is what we're told to do, what Jesus says he, to his disciples. He says, go and remit the sins. In other words, extend forgiveness to these areas that you're in and the people that you're around. He tells us to do that. The very same thing that he did, if you remember when he went to go heal yeah. the paralytic. Yeah. And he says, my son, your sins are forgiven. The Pharisees all got upset with him. How is it that this guy thinks he can remit sins? Only God can do that. You realize that just a few chapters later, he tells his disciples to do that very thing. Well, how could we remit sins? Only God can do that. And he was right. Only God can do that. But if you believe the Bible, it says that Christ lives in you. Is not Christ God? Hallelujah. Do we not have a right then? Not in our flesh, but if we are yielded to him for him to speak through us, the remittance of sins? Are we not to be priests unto the Lord? Now, I'm not Catholic. But, you know, the Catholic priests, what do they do? They remit the sins of those people who come to them. God says, I want a whole nation of priests who will speak for me, through me, Christ speaking through them and saying, your sins are forgiven. That's part of the gospel. It's for us to preach, your sins are forgiven. There's a way back home. Amen. Amen. And that's how we multiply. Fruitfulness comes as we allow the Spirit to live through us. We become fruitful. In fact, the if you if you go all the way to the end of the Bible and you look at the picture of the New Jerusalem, there's those trees of life that line the way. The water, the living water, comes out from under the the altar and flows down. And there's trees and they bear fruit in their season, different fruit every month and it says that the fruit is there and the leaves are for the what healing of the nation you know that's the fruit isn't for us the fruit is never for the tree the fruit is for others to partake in and they take of that and when they eat the fruit they go taste and see that the Lord is good and then we are able to experience the multiplication because people go, I want that. I want that healing. And this is how the kingdom is spread. It's not spread by dominion. It's spread by love and giving that same generous giving nature. All right. So that brings us, it's very good. Very, very good. These uh, animals. By the way, where do land animals live? On the land. That was not a trick question. On the land. Once again, this is a choice. This is a sheep. Okay, pretend. Really hard. Okay, so they live on the land. This is not based off of your feelings, so you don't do this because you feel like it. You do it because you make a choice to believe what God says and to do what you're supposed to do. You walk according to the Spirit and it's by the renewing of our mind that we begin to display the character and the attributes of Christ. It has nothing to do with our feelings. Okay. So, um, oh, and we eat, I like this, God gave us all the trees and all the green plants to eat as our food, right? That goes right back to what, what gets planted, what are the little seeds? Yeah, but what are they? What are they representative of? The Word of God. What do we eat? We eat from that which is of the Word as it takes root into us. Isn't that beautiful picture? That which will grow. Okay, so, uh, chapter 2, Genesis. So the heavens and the earth and everything in them 
were complete. We were formless and void, but now everything is created, everything is complete. By the seventh day, God completed his work that he had done, <coughs> and he rested on the seventh day from all the work that he had done, and God blessed that seventh day, and he declared it holy or separate, for on it he rested from his work of creation. And it's a time of reflection. Ooh, 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 ooh. Timmy. Thank you. Um, he rested from his, his creating. He, did, of course, didn't need rest. We all sort of recognize that. But he reflected on it. He looked at it. And he said, this was very good. This was very good. Notice, it, it doesn't have the statement that the evening and the morning was the seventh day. You ever notice that? There's every other day. Evening in the morning was the first day. Evening in the morning was the second day. Evening in the morning was the third day, fourth day, fifth day, sixth day, but not on the seventh day. There's no evening and morning. There's no... Wait, 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 wait. Revelation. Mm -hmm. And in that day, there will be no more day and night. This is a Sabbath rest that never ends. A Sabbath rest... Not only that, but where's your sun, New Jerusalem? Oh. Where's your moon? Where are your stars? They're all gone. Why? Because the Lamb is the light, and there is no night in that place. It's always a meeting time. He is so good. He is so good. It's always a meeting time. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. So we are in Hebrews 3 and 4. Is the the story of the rest that Israel has been longing for. The faithful ones of God have been longing for rest. Abraham longed for a city that was not built with human hands. He was looking for it. These people of old, of faith, they knew there was something more than what they were receiving and grasping hold of in this material world. And the writer of Hebrews goes to great lengths to say, it wasn't just about getting in the promised land. That was just a picture. Because if it was, then he wouldn't talk about a further rest. David wouldn't talk about a further rest in the psalm. And so he says it must have been something beyond just the promised land. And he said it points to Messiah. Our hearts are longing for a time when we can rest from our work. Well, what was our work? It was to try to be good. We so desperately, once we saw God, we perceived His Torah, we knew it was good, and we wanted to do that, and we tried, and we tried, and we tried, and we, we wasted ourselves trying to be good and failing. And God said, through the, the Hebrews writer, He said, there is a rest for those who have come in faith to Jesus. A rest for your soul. You no longer have to slave and work and try. You rest in Christ and His work. And then your work is finished. It's Jesus saying, Come unto me, all you who are weary and heaven laden, and I will give you rest. Rest for your soul. Take my yoke upon you. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. My teaching, yoke is a picture of teaching. He says, my teaching is easy. You stay in me, is what he says. Later on, he says, I am the vine. You are the branches. You abide in me. And you will be fruitful. You don't have to do anything for it. The, the branch doesn't will itself to bear fruit. The branch just stays connected to the vine. Amen. And then the the fruit just comes naturally. It doesn't have to do anything for it. It doesn't have to struggle or stress. But if you disconnect yourself from the vine, then you're good for nothing and you get cast aside. Because a dead branch cannot bear anything. Apart from me, you can do nothing. It's an easy teaching. It really is. Just stay connected to Jesus. Just stay connected. And so this is where our rest is, to stay connected with Jesus. And then we have rest for our souls. We have light eternal. No more day and night. The earth fades away. 
and we get a heavenly vision. So I want to just real quickly go back over these guys and show you. Seventh is rest. Jesus was the second Adam, right? Or the last Adam. And he did that which was right perfectly. He showed us how to live, right? Before he was conceived, there was an angel visit to Mary, and Mary was told, you're going to have a son. And she said, how is this going to happen? And he says, the Holy Spirit will come upon you, and you will be bear a child. Okay? Before anything actually occurred, before there was an actual impregnation of Mary. And so it was at the beginning of the earth, before anything was born, there was a thought, there was an impulse to have us. And so for us in our life, there is an inspiration that happens even before we become a believer in Christ, before we knew anything. So Jesus, he did that before thing. Because God exists before the earth. Okay, then we have a birth. Jesus was born, right? Bethlehem. And the light comes into the world, literally. Light shone in the sky, a star shone. And, and guided wise men to him and so forth. And there's awakening for us. And those shepherds were awakened on that hillside to the revelation that the king has come. The wise men were awakened by the star. And they came to see the little Christ child, right? And so there was a birth. And there was an awakening in us when we see the light of God. Then, in the second, there's a salvation. Jesus wasn't too old when he had to be whisked away into Egypt because Herod was going to kill him. Somewhere between birth and two years old. He was just a little guy. He didn't do anything for his salvation, by the way. It's a picture of what happens to us. We didn't do anything for our salvation. It was all Jesus. And, and for Jesus, his salvation came by God sending a dream to Joseph saying, get the child, take his mother, and get out of town. Go to Egypt, because Herod seeks the life of the child. And so he was saved, and he wasn't even saved by his own goodness or merit or anything. It was a picture of what we would go through. Third, growth in faith. It says that as Jesus grew, he grew in favor and stature with both God and man. He was found sitting in the synagogue talking with the, with the rabbis of the day. Not very much is spoken about this growing up time period. We do have these two parts, though. Twelve years old, he's divided from those who are his peers, befuddling those who are sitting there in, in, in the rabbinic um, uh, right of the day, their, their intellect and their pharisaism. And, and he was befuddling them right there, asking them questions they couldn't answer. And then we see the growth of his ministry and the fruit that comes from it that starts to, to spring up as he goes along. And, and, and it's a long time, though, 33 years if you want to think of it that way, from the time of salvation, or 31 years maybe, something like that, 30 years, uh, to the time that he's at the height of his ministry and the, and the fruit that comes from it. Then we too have that. Sometimes there's a very long period of time from the time of salvation to the time that we grow in maturity. We might even have ministries and things like that. I think of people like David Wilkerson. Wonderful ministry. Man of God. Loved the Lord. Had a second crisis in his 50s. Hudson Taylor, 45, 50 years old. He, he was broken. Couldn't handle the stresses of trying to do it all himself. Flesh had to die. Second witness. And that's here. So we have, fourth we have here, we have a death of flesh. Jesus, of course, had a death of flesh. His was at a cross. And he said, every disciple of mine has to come the same way I came. You've got to go to the cross. You've got to go through the cross. You can't just get up it and circle around it. You've got to go through it. You've got to get up on the cross and be there. And let your flesh die. And when you are mature in the Lord, you let this happen on a day-by-day -day basis. But sometimes it takes a long time.
to get from believing in God to letting your flesh actually die. Because none of us like saying that we will agree, okay, the bad parts of our life are, you know, that's bad. I should get rid of that. But the good parts, too. What about my desire for ministry? If I'm doing it in the flesh, it'll avail nothing. What about my desire for a good and healthy home, you know? Or I just want to serve the Lord doing this thing with this natural talent that I have. And God invariably seems to ask for those things and say, put that on the altar. Put your Isaac on the altar. But that's the promise you gave me. Put it on the altar anyway. You know, God even asked the same thing of Jesus. Jesus knew that he had been given a people. In his prayer before the Lord, right before he goes to death, he says, I have kept all that you have given me. And yet he's going to the cross. He's going to lose them all. From an earth standpoint, he, in a way, was putting those whom he had been given by the Lord as a promise on the altar, sort of a metaphorical altar. He was laying that down because he was going to die. He was going to be separated from them. The very thing he had been promised by his father, he was going to lose. And we have to be willing to lose even the promises that God has given us to lay that down and say, okay, Lord, if it's your will, I'm going to put that down. I don't know how it works. I love the statement in Hebrews that Abraham, it was said about Abraham, that Abraham reasoned, well, if I put Isaac on the altar and I kill him, I guess God will just raise him. That was his thought process. No wonder he was the father of faith. He just figured God would raise him from the dead. Praise the Lord, he is the power to raise from the dead. So here we identify in the crucifixion of Christ. We're co-crucified. I am crucified with Christ. But nevertheless, I live. All right, but before we are identified with living, we're identified in the burial. That area in the ground, that, that dark, internal, intimate place. You know, our birds and our fish, we see them at times, but a lot of their life is hidden away. We don't see them. They're either way high up in the air and we see them as little dots flying around up there, or they are oftentimes hidden away in the oceans and we don't see them at all. And it's only with technology and ability to go in and spy on them that we see them. <laughs> uh, it's, it's the things in the hidden and the secret. And in that quiet and that secret place, that's where the Lord drives those roots deep. Yeah, this is this is also related to that priesthood. And the priests, they did all their work in secret, did they not? Servitude. Their servitude. So, I mean, they did some stuff out in the open. You know, they sacrificed all, you know, the sacrifices. But when they arranged the bread and they trimmed the wicks and they put the incense on the on the altar of incense, and when the Day of Atonement came, the high priest had to go into the Holy of Holies place to take care of the um, anointing that had to be done there, the application of the blood. It was all secret. Nobody really knew what was going on. And that deep inner working that's within our soul, our submission, our, our choosing to give thanks, our laying it down, all that happens within our being in that hidden place. And it's only made manifest as we continue on. So we're, we are identified in this burial. We don't know much about what happened when Christ was buried. Peter gives us a little bit of a hint. says that he went and preached to those underground. But we don't really know a lot. But then there was life. There was resurrection life. And we are identified in that resurrection And this is where the dominion comes. Because it's in the power of the resurrection that we have a victorious, conquering life. God overcame death and hell and every work of the devil. Mm -hmm. And he extended that to us as an inheritance. Mm -hmm. That we would be groomed to rule and reign with him. You know... During this time period, these the flesh, burial, and resurrection, which we go through all the time, God uses the incidences of our lives, the disciplining, 
of our lives through tragedy and through hardship and through even our own sins to refine us. You know, the punishment is cared for. Punishment deals with judgment. Punishment deals as a, as a penalization for what we did wrong. And Christ took that. But now it says we are disciplined as sons. Disciplining has an eye towards character building. And if we have a king in heaven who has adopted us as his children and he is disciplining us as his children, it's with an eye towards character, not because he wants to make us morally good. It has nothing to do with moral goodness and everything to do with his desire to groom us to rule and reign. That's the stated purpose that we would rule and reign as joint heirs with Christ. And we must manifest the character and likeness of God, which is what he originally intended in the garden, was that we would display who he is. And that's what he's doing here. And so that disciplining time period, sit under it patiently. Wait in it, because that's what makes us the sons and daughters of God. And then that brings us into rest. And this is so exciting, because this is our identification through ascension. It says that we are seated in the heavenly places with God. Now our viewpoint is changed. We're no longer on the earth looking at earth things like earth people. We are in the heavenlies, seated with God, looking down on earth, seeing from His perspective. And the more that we gaze on Him, the more we are capable of looking with heavenly eyes. The more that we have Christ fill our vision, the more we no longer see the earth as important. It grows strangely dim, as the old song says. It's how those saints who sit in and, and barren cells for their faith. I think it was Bunyan made the comment that the cell was like it was decked with jewels. This cold cell where he was being persecuted because of his faithfulness to God and preaching the word of God. And yet he saw it as a sweet place, an inner chamber of communion with God. Why? Because his eyes weren't on the earth. Yeah. He saw the heavens, and he saw from that perspective. And we see from that perspective, there's no darkness. There's no fear of death. You're in rest. And it doesn't matter what happens to your earth body. You just see it as, okay, I'm down here doing work. And when God's done with me down here, I get to go home, praise the Lord. So this is the rest that is promised to us. This is our inheritance, and this is where we are seeking to go is in to the heavenly places and that's what God ultimately wants for us that is his his goal is for us to enjoy the fellowship with him communion with him that's why he created us way back at the beginning that was the intent thank you father for for the word Jesus awesome instruction just amazing from your mouth the incredible inheritance you say the the earthly kings would say i would give you up to half my kingdom oh god you've given us your whole kingdom thank you oh lord jesus your name we thank you amen god can i get 15 minutes or less or your pizza's free uh, these these are words words of the Lord that I, I I've been praying, um, and and God saying you have got to give these words. Go to John chapter twelve. This is this is very very important. So what do we do with that? What do we do with that? Lord, these are your words. I'm I'm being a faithful servant. I I don't know what else to do. Uh, verse twenty four. When you get there, John twelve twenty four. This will give, y'all should be leaping and dancing. I assure you, unless a grain of wheat falls to the ground and dies, it remains by, by itself. 
Folks, you come to Jesus, you come and die. Now, now that's not, not just a one-time thing. Mm-hmm. Meeting in the morning. Let me put this in practical terms. Is that not when you are by yourself? And then is that not a death where now you can die to yourself daily? Get before the face of God and seek Him? Now when you come out of that closet, now you have life. Is that not what some of the saints of old, Jonathan Edwards, Smith Wigglesworth, they would weep before the king in, in their closet, but yet they would come out shining like the sun. Uh, Jonathan Edwards, I think his daughter, Jerusha, said, you know, we hear sinners in the hands of an angry God. He was a horrible person. No, 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 no. All the testimonies say he was the most loving father, full of peace, full of beauty, and tender. Because he saw the king. Because he was before his face. Mm-hmm. But he had to die first in the morning. I... I I want to not be legalistic about this. It's uh, it is a struggle. The Lord reminded me this morning: Is this not a death? I've I've been lacking sleep. You know, sort of. I like, oh God, I don't want to wake up right now. <laughs> well, He says, "Is this not the ministry of darkness I've called you to? A burial in the ground? Is this not a death?" Unless a grain of wheat falls to the ground, it has to die. Okay, let's let's take a look at a seed kernel. Okay, pardon my my little. Hopefully, it may, may look like a coffee bean. Uh, okay, this thing that's your chaff seed coat, even. Guys, on the ground, it can stay on the ground. Guys, quit fighting. Quit fighting. Quit fighting it. Die! I'm not saying kill yourself. God forbid. No, we're not talking fleshly things. Even the seed coat. How? And we know this from science. How does the seed coat break down? Soak beans. Okay, when you eat beans and you don't soak them, and give you upset stomach, digestion issues, whatnot. What is water? Spirit and the Word to break the seed coat. So the little uh, germ, uh, the germ can actually bury down, take root. Okay, are we not God's workmanship? Are we not the branches? Okay. So, someone asked, how do I hear from God? I've I've wondered about that a while. Yesterday, the Lord gave me an amazing revelation. Proverbs 3, verse 11 and 12. My son, this 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 is critical. I'm not talking about self-flagellation. I'm, I'm going to put my flesh to death. No, then it's you. Then it's you trying to get to God. You're no different than Cain. Proverbs 3.11 My son, do not despise the Lord's instruction, my son, and do not loathe His discipline, for the Lord disciplines the one he loves just as a father, the son he delights in. Guys, stop resisting. You you know what it is. Something in you, an event happens and you have this reaction. That's not right. Stop right there. Actually, you don't deserve, you deserve worse. That initial response, we need to be asking the Lord, please show me the difference between the earthly worth things and eternally worthy things. Unless you die, what's going to happen unless there's a death? You're going to stay down on the ground. Somebody will trample you. You'll get kicked around like this seed. 
and uh, you won't grow. Guys, you won't grow. Submit to the discipline of the Lord. Allow Jesus. If you're fighting to get off that ground, you know, you can get off the ground as, as, as a seed. You've got to die first. How, and what happens to the plant? Where does it go? Once the plant goes down into the ground and is buried, I'm, I'm speaking in, in illustration. Which direction? We want to get off the ground. If you're fighting to get off the ground, your shell hasn't died off and you cannot live. That involves the Holy Spirit. There's a, there's a song by Audio Adrenaline, um, Pierce. I love it. Make me, break me, I am pierced. Allow Him to break you. Only He knows He made you. Let Him break you and submit to it. Submit yourself, therefore, to God. Resist the devil. You can't resist the devil unless you submit. The world, submit to the discipline of Jesus. Allow Him to break you. This world has nothing to offer. I don't care of what business, 401k, ministry, relationship with your kids. I don't care. If, you, you got to be sorely. If only I get to. No, sorry. If only my relationships are restored. No. Because you will be waiting for the other foot to drop. Ain't going to happen. Jesus proved it by dying a criminal's death. He proved that this world has nothing to offer. How? The flesh truly can do nothing. What did he lose? Dignity, respect, property, honor, defense, his father's relationship for that brief moment. He didn't have a loincloth on the cross. He was naked. He was humiliated. He was insulted. I've heard people talk about, well, you need to maintain dignity. Full. You need to die in Christ and rise. The uh, read book by Ta- uh, Reinhard Bonnke, Taking Action. He saves the best for last, speaking in tongues. There's so much negativity and so much trying to disprove the gift of tongues. Yeah. Yeah. Why? Yeah. Because it's embarrassing. I've heard more than, well, I don't know if it was a weird. Feel weird. Yeah. Yeah. Be a fool for Christ. Mm-hmm. What have you got to lose? Oh, are you trying to maintain your dignity? Oh, what are you going to get? So what? Who cares? Let it die. Because Galatians 1.10 says, if you serve man, you're not a servant of Christ. Period. It's that simple. What makes us any different to get the loss that Jesus got? Are we any different? Is that not the inheritance that He's called us to? All these things are that earthly shell. Let them die. Let Him destroy or eliminate that which brings chaos and no peace. Guys, you know what it is. You know, the Holy Spirit shows you, I'm not in peace. I'm in chaos. I'm not where I want to be. I'm unsatisfied. Guys, you know what it is. That very thing that, that you, you're trying to strive and struggle with. Guys, bring it to Jesus. Okay, God, I give it to you. Here, you take it. Kill it. I want you. Okay, so that you may have life. Okay, if you want to come to Jesus, then you must be ready to die. Now, I'm not talking about losing your life, but even still, your heart must be totally abandoned Fearing no loss but Christ Himself if you don't have Him. You guys catch that? Let me say that again. You must be totally abandoned to Christ. You must be totally ready to die. That the only thing you are afraid of is losing Christ if you don't have Him. Jesus, I need to have you. If I don't, I am undone. Uh, Guys, that's all I have to say. We are... Guys, seek him. Seek him. If 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 you have not allowed him to have that penetrating work in you day by day, guys, it's you gotta lose to gain. You gotta lose to gain. It's hard in a sense of mentally like, well, uh, it's it, it's it's gonna go somewhere. Give it to the Lord, or He's going to get it. Either way, 
he, he's, the more you give and deny yourself, this is an immutable uh, principle in the scripture. The more you give of yourself, this is a kingdom principle, the more you give of yourself, the more the Lord uh, flourishes in you and bears forth in you. My Father prunes, those who bear fruit, my Father prunes. What? Bear fruit and then he cuts it off? Yes! So you can bear more fruit! That's the hiddenness! That has to happen. Folks, don't resist the Lord. If you hear his voice, do not harden it. Guys, whatever it costs, whatever it takes, it's got to hurt. It's got to hurt. I'm not saying pain for pain's sake. I'm saying, Lord Jesus, that's why it's called a sacrifice. I don't feel like singing. I don't care. God doesn't care. He says, sing. He says, look, it's good for you. Come meet with me. God, I'm tired. Come meet with me. God, I've got too much going on. Come meet with me. Listen to me. Be still. God, I've got too much to do. Be still. God, I have responsibilities. Be still. Stop fighting me. Stop kicking against the pricks. I pray this resonates with y'all. This is uh, this is a message the Lord gave me, and uh, that's all I have to say about that. Hi, Heavenly Father, thank you for your word. Jesus, thank you so much. You 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 are good. Your word is good. You 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 break us. You make us. God, bend us like a reed. Don't break us like an oak. Lest the, there is nothing left. Lord Jesus, your word says that we are not to stiffen our neck to rebuke lest we will be broken beyond healing. Oh God, when someone's neck is broken, they're dead. Lord, have thine own way. Have thine own way. Thou art the potter. We are the clay. May we be more ready for your use. In Jesus' name, amen.